Hi and welcome back. We are covering another chapter called Cryptographic Concepts in Ethical Hacking. Now, to understand it, first of all, we'll have to keep in mind that uh, whenever we talk about cryptographic concepts, uh, it refers to the collection of techniques that mainly either scramble the messages or other data so that only intended recipients can understand them. Or we can say that it can generate short representations of the data that can help determine if the data has been changed or not. And then we'll be covering again the CIA triad, which is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So the key concepts which would be covered in this lecture would be cryptographic algorithms and ciphers, symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Then we'll be covering the purpose of public key infrastructure, where we'll be talking about the digital signatures, etc. Then we'll be going to hashing, cryptanalysis, and then the future forms of cryptography. Now we'll see the cryptographic basics. And uh, uh, before we explain, uh, we can understand that it's not new. Uh, it was there uh, even at the time of Roman Empire when the Julius Caesars used uh, what is now a famous encryption cipher to communicate sensitive information uh, with his generals. Now cryptography is a body of no no knowledge that deals with the protection and preservation of information. So if we want to hide our information so that the other party cannot read the information, we use cryptography. Now that gives a sense of protection, which we call about confidentiality, integrity, and we'll be covering non-repudiation in this one. Uh, that the message, if it's coming from a person, it is authentic and it has not been changed. A collection of techniques that mainly either scramble the messages, means that the data cannot be read, even if it's traveling on the network. Anyone can uh, capture the packets, which we call as man in the middle attacks. Even if they'll capture the messages, they'll not be able to understand that what's the actual message which is conveyed through the network or other data that can only intended recipients can read from the general short representation of the data that can help determine if the data has been changed. So not only it would provide a protection against any kind of man in the middle attacks, but it would give you an authentication as well that if the data which was sent from the source to the destination has not been changed or scrambled uh, through the course of its uh, communication on the network. Now it can provide data confidentiality, integrity, and non-repudiation. Now next we'll see that in a code, a mechanism that operates on complete words or phrases like how we actually change the words or how do we actually scramble the data, it's called cipher, operates on a single letter or a short sequence of letters to carry out the encryption process. So either it would take a stream or it would take a complete block of it. Um, which is explained in the next line. It's a common form of cipher include substitution as the Caesar cipher to transposition stream or a block. So if we are changing or we are encrypting bit by bit, we call it a stream cipher where we are taking each bit and encrypting it. On the other hand, if you're taking a complete block and encrypting it, it works the same, but the time consumed by stream cipher takes more time as compared to the block cipher. Now the Caesar cipher is also called a shift cipher where we shift the items or the characters for any specific letter. For example, if you have a letter A which is appearing first, if you are shifting the letters, A would correspond to D and same goes for B would correspond to E. So that's how you change the characters or we transpose them so that the other party who's receiving the message will not be able to understand it works by substituting each character in a message with a character a certain number a position to the left or right of the current character that's called a shift character or shifting the character next we have authentication authentication is a pos process of positively identifying a party as a user computer or a service Authentication of electronic messages provide the ability to validate that a message comes from a known or a trusted source. So it identifies a party, user or computer as a service, um, plays a vital role in a system stability, validates messages coming from a trusted source. Unauthenticated messages aren't accepted as genuine. So it would be destroyed and it would request that a new message should be sent. 
Now, to maintain the security information used to authenticate as the identity, such as a personal identification number, which could be there in order to verify the identity of a person, it could be a password that you remember. And you, you must keep uh, a secret to prevent disclosure of the unauthorized parties. So you'll make sure that only authorized parties will have access to those things. Now, in order to enforce it, we have different ways through which we make sure that only authorized people can access the resources. Um, you can access, um, you can have access control list. You can even control it through the uh, firewalls where you'll allow certain people to access certain resources after they will be authenticated and that authentication could be based on the location. It could be based on the time. It could be based on the geographical locations. So it really depends how you want to define the parameters for authentication. Now, uh, some of the protocols which uh, rely on cryptography are IPv6, uh, which is the uses the encryption to authenticate, validate, and to protect the sensitive information. Then we have IPsec, IPsec, which is IP security as well, is an IPv6 component used to virtual private networks. Um, optional is IPv4. Uh, IPsec is usually used when we are doing point-to-point -point, uh, uh, communication between two parties and we want to protect our transmission of data which is flowing from one network to another. We use IPsec communication for that. Then you can see SNMP protocol, which is version 2. SNMP is usually used to communicate with the devices which are there on the network, like your printers, your switches, etc., to check the health status of it. Then we have secure socket layer, make sensitive use of cryptography for the secure communication on the networks. You might have seen um, SSL when you are accessing certain websites, which are secure websites. Now transport layer security, TLS, which is a successor of a TLS, uh, successor of a SSL. Now we have secure shell to replacement of some of the older protocols um, that we used to use. And uh, they are usually um, there when we are communicating with the um, other parties using um, a um, shell like we have uh, putty um, and with the help of which we are communicating with any other device in order to um, have the console based access to it um, then we have uh, many other protocols like FTP, file transfer protocol, uh, Telnet used to be there uh, before. Now it has been changed. We are using SSL, which is secure shell over here. Um, SM SMMT, which is simple mail transfer protocol is also there. Then post office protocol, which is POP3. SMTP and POP3 are used in our um, Outlook uh, communications or we are dealing with Microsoft Exchange services. Then we have hypertext transfer protocol, which is HTTP as well. Now we'll be talking about integrity on and non-repudiation. Now when we say integrity, integrity is to verify the information or the ability to verify that the information has not been altered and has remained in the form in the original form as it was intended or created by the creator. Uh, now, uh, it has to detect the changes to the data, does not preserve the data confidentiality. Now, to take an example, if a organization is transferring, for example, $10,000 to another company, it should not be changed to $100,000 when it reaches the destination. So the data should remain in the original format. If we'll talk about the everyday activities, for example, the registration process of the students and their records in the transcripts, etc., the data that was saved five years ago should remain the same after 10 years, there should be no change in the data and the process of verifying that the data remains the same is called integrity there as well. Now, non-repudiation is the ability to have definitive proof that the message originated from a specific party. Now, in order to protect that, we have digital certificates, messages for authentication, etc. Um, it includes the digital certificates, digital signatures, IP security as well. And in practice, we can see that if you're sending an email out through the Microsoft Outlook or um, any email systems, usually they have an option which you can enable or can uh, configure to have digital signatures with your email just to make sure that the email has been sent from the uh, person who is 
he or she is claiming to be. Now, on the other hand, you might have seen that there are lots of uh, different software available in the market which helps us in encrypting the hard drives, encrypting the partitions on the hard drive, encrypting USB drives, um, etc. Now, BitLocker is a, a very common software which is coming with Windows uh, 10 onwards. It is a tool in order to encrypt your data on the hard drives. Next, we have a very interesting concept, which is quite common as well, where we talk about symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. Now, symmetric encryption or algorithm uses a single shared key for encrypting or decrypting the data. So whenever we are talking about a single key encryption, we are always referring to a symmetric encryption algorithm. Now, asymmetric key algorithm requires two mathematical related keys, one public and one private. So that's the difference between symmetric and asymmetric. In symmetric, there will be one shared key which would be transferred over the network. Now it has its own issues that if that key is leaked out, your data can be compromised. Whereas in asymmetric key, we have two pair of keys. One we call as a public key and the other would be called as a private key. Now the operation performed with one key can be reversed only with the other key. Use the key to perform mathematical substitution, transposition, permutations, or other operations to a plain text, which is an unencrypted test, uh, to create the output called the ciphertext. So once a normal data is converted into a jumbled or encrypted text, it is called a ciphertext, which is also called an encrypted data. So we'll be using one key to encrypt the data and the other person would be able to decrypt it with the other key combining his own private key. So the process is, like every person would have a private key and a public key. The public key can be shared with the public. Um, the private key would be confidential to the person. Now, if uh, Elise want to send some data to Bob, Elise would use her private key and public key of Bob in order to encrypt the data. Once Bob would receive the data, Bob would use public key of Elise and his own private key to decrypt the data. That's how it works in the nutshell. Now, in the next slide, we'll try to understand the concept by understanding that it uses the same key to encrypt the data for symmetric encryption. Two main approaches um, any algorithm can use, stream processing or a block processing, as I explained earlier. Stream processing goes bit by bit. Block processing goes complete, uh, taking a complete block of eight bits, 12 bits, or 16 bits, depends what's the block size of it. Key must be distributed to all parties who need to perform the encryption or end description of the data. So you'll have to send the key to the other person that I'm using this encryption key. So if you'll use this key, you'll be able to decrypt the data. A process must be in place to distribute the keys of all parties cannot transmit the key in the same way as the encryption of data. Now, as you can see, a plain text is there, which is readable. Now they used an encryption key over here that converted this plain text into a cipher text, which is an encrypted data. Now, once the other person received the cipher text, which is a encrypted text, they'll use the same key which was used for encryption to decrypt the data and you'll be able to read the data in a clear text format. Now, to understand it in a, another picture, we have original data. We used a secret key, which is the same on both hands. It encrypted the data, again, the same the decryption key would be used, which was a secret key, which was same to see the original data. Now we have a symmetric encryption. Um, no, we are still talking about the symmetric encryption. In this uh, point, we are covering different algorithms which are used for um, symmetric encryption. Just keep in mind that whenever we are working on any certifications, you must know that what are different algorithms for symmetric encryption and what are different algorithms for asymmetric encryption. These are quite common algorithms that we use. Uh, first of all, we have triple DES. Uh, we call it by 3DES. It's a more secure version of DES that performs the equivalent of three rounds of DES encryption. Uh, so before that, it was DES, then, then there was a double DES encryption, etc. Um, but since it it was considered as deprecated. Now we are using the latest standard, which is triple DES, which we write as 3DES as well. 
Next, we have Advanced Encryption Standards, which is AES. You might have seen it when you are encrypting or you are setting up a key for your wireless access points. Uh, you usually see this kind of algorithm. Uh, now, this, it's a successor of DES, which is far more uh, resistant to brute force attacks. AES is a mathematically constructed uh, to be virtually impossible to break using the correct, uh, current technology that we are using. Uh, then we have Blowfish. Now Blowfish is a highly efficient block cipher that can have a key length of up to 448 bits. Um, then we have International Data Encryption Algorithm, which we call as ID as well. It uses 64-bit um, input and output data block and features a 128-bit key. Then we have RC4, RC5, and RC6. Now RC4 is a stream cipher designed uh, by Ron Revest um, that is used for WEP encryption. Again, you can see this in your wireless communications as well when we are setting up a key for that. Now RC5 is a fast block cipher designed um, again by the same um, guy called Ron Revest, and then it can use a large key size. Uh, then RC6 is a cipher uh, derived from the RC5. Then we have Skipjack is a symmetric algorithm of 80-bit length uh, developed by US National Security Agency. And finally, we have Quad Cipher. It is relatively a new system of cipher that supports the uh, provable security arguments. Now further in symmetric encryption, uh, we can see that uh, to guarantee the confidentiality when using a symmetric algorithm, authorized users must possess a unique key. So they must have a unique key in order to decrypt the data. Each pair of the users must create and share a unique key and the number of key pairs increases uh, rapidly. Next further, if we'll see in symmetric encryption, uh, we can see that there is a very important concept of key management. Now, key should be stored and transmitted by secure means to avoid interception. Now, the problem in this key is that it's a single key. If it's leaked out, it can compromise the data. So it should be transmitted in a way, in a way that it should not be uh, um, intercepted once it's being transferred from the source to the destination. Uh, keys should be generated by a pseudo random process to prevent guessing the key. So it should generate the key which is different from the key which was generated earlier. So no one can guess the actual algorithm or the actual pattern of uh, uh, generating the uh, symmetric keys. The key lifetime should correspond with the sensitivity of the data that it's protecting. So uh, you'll choose the key according to the um, data standards or according to the confidentiality level of the data that you're trying to encrypt. Key should be properly destroyed when the process in, uh, for which they were used has lapsed. Um, so it's not like you are using the same key to encrypt the data over and over again. If it's a different kind of data used for a different thing, you'll use uh, the proper means in order to discard the key in a proper way. Now we have a symmetric encryption also called a public key cryptography because we are sharing the public key with the other person. It uses public and private keys both. Everyone generally has access to public keys so you can share comfortably your public key with anyone. Um, you can use the public key to encrypt the data or to validate or reverse the operation performed by the private key. Only holder of the corresponding private keys can decrypt the data because I have my own private key, but my public key is used by someone else. So in order to read that data that the other person is sending me using my public key, I'll use my private key on it to decrypt the data. If holder of the private key encrypts something with private key, anyone with access to the public key can decrypt it because we are using this algorithm for the uh, digital certificates as well. So that public key is available. It's a publicly available information and you can even verify the um, integrity of that certificate which is issued to a specific uh, uh, website or a specific application. Now you can see a plain text that is readable. It's encrypted. Um, so once it's encrypted, you can see it's in a cipher text. The receiver's uh, public key will be used in order to generate this ciphertext. Now, once the receiver will use, he'll use the private key 
uh, with uh, since his public key was used earlier now he's used his uh, private key to decrypt the message and the message would be available in the clear format now here a public key is used to encrypt the data different keys are there now he'll use the private key on his side to decrypt the data which was in the scrambled format now to see it further in asymmetric encryption examples of asymmetric encryption are Duffy Hellman, a process used to establish and exchange the asymmetric key over an insecure medium. Then we have Algamal, which is uh, a hybrid algorithm that uses asymmetric key to encrypt the symmetric key, which is often used to encrypt and rest of the message. Then we have RSA, which is patented in 1977, still used in e-commerce and compatible applications for online transactions, etc. Then we have elliptic curve cryptography, a computationally intensive algorithm based on solving the elliptic curve discrete algorithm. Now, um, keep in mind that uh, since it's an encryption method, it requires certain CPU resources in order to encrypt and decrypt the messages. So it depends what kind of data is it and how important is it. So based on that, they'll decide that what algorithm they are going to use for this uh, specific thing now we are comparing the uh, symmetric and symmetric encryption so if we'll say that uh, in symmetric encryption the number of keys is one um, uh, which can be shared by two or more parties whereas asymmetric key it has a pair of keys now the type of keys used is a key secret in a symmetric where is one key is private and public in a symmetric loss of the keys can result in disclosure and modification whereas we don't have this problem in a symmetric encryption relative speed is faster in symmetric encryption since it's one key will be used whereas comparatively it's a bit slow uh, as compared to symmetric um, now the performance algorithm is more efficient for the symmetric since it's fast whereas it's less efficient because it takes some time the key length is a fixed key length whereas the key length can change in the asymmetric key and then in the application is ideal for encrypting files and communication channels whereas uh, for asymmetric it's ideal for encrypting and distributing um, the keys for providing authentication now further uh, uh, we'll have some more techniques which we call as hashing. Now hash is one way hashing function in a type of cryptographic algorithm used to provide integrity and non-repudiation. So it's there to compute in one direction but extremely difficult to reverse. Uh, it's a uh, provide a unique data fingerprint changes materially in the event of the data alteration of tampering so if you will change the data the complete fingerprint of the file would change now hash value or message digest often called the hash um, are a result of a variable amount of data being mapped or a fixed length so it provided data fingerprint that will materially change if the input value changes it's very useful in detecting the data alterations of tampering now hash values are also called uh, the message digest as explained over here or we call them hash hashes are not for encryption but rather uh, for authentication and ensuring integrity and provide non-repudiation of the data now if we'll see further uh, different uh, hash functions that we have common hashing algorithms now again for the certification purposes you must know the basic understanding or you must know that these are the hashing algorithms which are quite famous and used for hashing now md5 as you say md is for message digest abbreviation a message digest 2 is an older way of hashing used for privacy enhanced mail protocol along with md5 produces 128 bit of hash value for arbitrary input it's a similar structure to md4 and md5 but is a bit slow and is less secure then i have message digest which is md4 a way of hash function that provide 128 bit also faster and more secure than md2 then md5 provides the uh, redesigned version of md4 which is uh, of 128 bit and MD5 is most commonly a cryptographic hashing algorithm which is currently in use. Next we have uh, HAVAL, a variable length one hash function which uh, and modification of MD5. Uh, it uses 1024 uh, bits, uh, twice the uh, bit of MD5 and is faster than MD5. 
then we have uh, secure hash algorithm which we call uh, SHA-0 or 1 provides 160 uh, bit fingerprint and it's no longer considered secure because there were some vulnerable attacks and it was compromised um, then we have secure hash algorithm 2 which is SHA-2 which is a group of SHA algorithms uh, which uh, possesses the message of 100, uh, 512 bit blocks and at the uh, padding uh, if needed to get the data to add the length of uh, uh, right number of bits SHA is also included in the other version including SHA-256 and 512 which you can see a complete video about how to calculate the hashes etc is available on our channel um, if you want to download a software you can uh, look for hash calculator and you can find certain information like uh, certain files can be um, uh, calculated for their hash values for SHA and other things so it's a very good application free source available online which you can download and check the hash values of the files and folders then we have SHA algorithm which is SHA-3 formerly known as KCAC algorithm was selected in 2002 by NIST SHA standard supports the same key length as um, SHA-2 but is far more secure than that then we have Whirlpool which is 513-bit hashing algorithm that was uh, derived from AES and then we have RIP MD, which is the integrity uh, message digest uh, family algorithm that is designed in 1990 alternative to MD5 hashing algorithm now in next we have a thing called birthday attacks in this concept we can say that a collision can occur when two different hash inputs may result in the same output for example we ha calculated the hatch of something and uh, it's not quite common but it can happen that if they will have the same output we can say that it's a collision or we call it as a birthday attack so in birthday attack the attacker takes the advantage of the probability of eventual collisions which would have the same um, uh, output of the hash which is calculated for that now based on the probability of individual sharing the same birthday what is the fewest number of the chosen num uh, random number which is greater than 50 so they are talking about the probability of it when attacking a cryptographic hash the goal is to exploit the possibility that two messages might share the same digest it's called the hash function outputs if somehow it's appearing the same the attack is based on probabilities in which two messages hash will have the same value which we call a collision can be found and then it is exploited md5 can be targeted for uh, the birthday attacks next is digital signatures now digital signatures play an important role it, it can combine uh, public key cryptography and, um, and hashing uh, it's used for creating a digital signature for existing data requires two main steps the message or the information to be sent is passed through the hashing algorithm to create a hash to verify the integrity of the message then the hash is encrypted using the sender private key just like we talked about asymmetric encryption the digital signatures will be used and we are using it over here as a key in the encryption process further we'll see that the sender then sends the signature along with the original unencrypted message to the recipient who can reverse the process and when the receiver receives the message with the signature the receiver validates the identity of the sender and then retrieves the public key to decrypt the message now you can see it's the same mechanism which we talked about in asymmetric encryption once the signature is decrypted the resulting clear text is actually the message hash from the sender the receiver will run the same hashing algorithm to generate the local hash of the received message and the hashes both the original and the newly created one should match if they do not the message has been altered because the sender calculated hash is different as compared to what it was sent by them so you can see that the data hash function there is a hash value of it encryption um, of the hash using the signer private key so he used his private key to encrypt the message and it created a certificate with a signature of it and attach it to the document which was digitally signed now the digitally signed document would be received by the other end 
and you'll be able to see a hash value of it and a data hash function now they'll decrypt it using the signer public key and their own private key and if they can see that the hash is same if the hashes are equal the signature is valid now we have another concept which we call it as a public key infrastructure the first thing that comes to our mind whenever we are talking about public key infrastructure are the certificates or the certificate authorities which are quite common and they are available on the internet so if you want to have a digital certificate for your website to verify the identity of it and to make sure that all the communication which is taking place on that website is 100% secure you'll have to acquire a digital certificate for which you'll have to contact, uh, contact the digital certificate issuing authorities which are available online like DigiSign and VeriSign, etc. They issue the certificates. They'll charge you to give that certificate or to issue you a certificate for a, a specific timeline. Now it's an approach to secure um, the storing and publishing keys in a public key cryptography provides a framework through which two parties can establish a trusted relationship even if the parties have no prior knowledge of one another just like if you are accessing amazon or uh, walmart website or any other website through you are using um, your credit card they don't know you you don't know the company as such but still you can trust them using the certificate which is available on their website now the framework used to manage or create store and distribute public key or digital certificates safely and securely brings trusted integrity and the security of the electronic transactions which are taking place on that particular website now next uh, we have certificate authority we have registration authority and the certification revocation list now certificate authority is the entity responsible for enrollment creation management uh, validation revocation of the digital certificate so that's the authority which would issue a certificate now registration authority is an entity responsible for accepting information about a party wishing to obtain a certificate so if a company wants to get a digital certificate they'll have to contact registration authority which would collect all the relevant details make sure that the company is authentic the businesses that they are doing are um, are legit and they are following the standards which are there only then they'll forward the details of these companies to the certificate authority to issue the actual certificates so the registration authority generally do not issue the certificates or manage certificates in any way in some situations entities known as local registration authorities are delegated um, are delegated the ability to issue the certificates but that's not their uh, task actually now the certificate revocation list is a list of certificates that have been revoked prior to the assigned expiration which is published by certificate authority so the certificate authority can revoke any certificate they want if they'll see any malpractice or anything like that which is called certification revocation list now further if we'll see in public key infrastructure uh, we have digital certificate which are pieces of information which like a driver license which is in re real world they are used to positively prove the identity of a person or a party um, or a computer service etc certificate distribution system is a combination of a software hardware uh, services procedures can, can th that can distribute the certificates now to understand it further i'm showing two different websites which is very sign uh, we, um, they are responsible to issue the certificates also and you can further check VeriSign enables the world to connect online with re reliability um, and confidence anytime anywhere so if you'll read in detail they are talking about all that different features that they have the other one is DigiCert um, they have different digital certificates for enterprise websites code softwares etc and you can purchase the uh, certificates from here for your uh, website if you are interested in or if you want to have any specific uh, uh, certificate for your own uh, website that can be issued by um, this uh, DigiCert. I'll show you in action how the certificate appears on a website but first try to understand uh, the concept uh, of uh, the uh, um, root certificate authorities, peer certificate authorities and subordinate certificate authorities. Now here we can see that a root certificate authority initiates all trusted paths for a certificate 
or we can say it's a principal certificate authority for its domain. So CA that initiates all paths. The root certificate authority is also the principal of certificate authority for its domain. The root certificate authority uh, can be thought of as a top of a pyramid where the pyramid represents the certificate authority hierarchy. Then we have uh, uh, peer certificate authority has a self-signed certificate that is distributed to certificate holders and used by them to, initi uh, to initiate the certificate path. So it can issue further certificate paths. Now we have the subordinate certificate authority, a certificate authority that does not begin trust paths. In some deployments is also called a child path. Now we'll talk about registration authority. Now the registration authority is positioned between the client and certificate authority that is used to support or offload the work from the certificate authority. So as I told you, it would collect all the information. If you want to apply for a certificate, you'll have to contact the registration authority. It cannot issue a certificate, accept request, verifies the identities and pass information to certificate authority to generate certificates. Now certification revocation list is a list of certificates that have been revoked. Certificate typically added to the list because it is no longer a trusted website or a trusted entity. Now we have digital certificates ensures that the integrity of a public key um, that makes sure that the key remains unchanged and is valid from validates that the public key belongs to a certificate owner that is associated with that and to ensure the compatibility between the certificate and digital certificates commonly built in the form of X509 standard. So whenever we are talking about X509 standard, the first thing that, you sh uh, that should come to your mind is that we are talking about digital certificates. Now this is a digital certificate that is shown over here. I'll show you that how can we find a digital certificate or of a website by log by going to any website like this if again we are on uh, digicert website we can click on this icon which is a lock icon appearing in uh, chrome browser it would say that the connection is secure if you click on it it will say certificate is valid issued to digicert so if you click on it it would open this digital certificate now here you can see that it is issued to the name of the website then issued by DigiCert, which is the company itself, which is issuing the certificate and the validity period is appearing. It was issued on 18th of April and it is valid till uh, May 5th, 2023. And we covered the SHA fingerprints like the SHA algorithms. Um, and you can see a algorithm fingerprint appearing over here, which verifies the identity of the certificate. Further, if you want to get the details of that certificate, you can get these details like version number, serial number, and the certificate, and then the issuer details. So if you'll click on it, you'll get all those different details, which would verify the identity of any specific certificate. You can export the certificate from here as well. Now, if we'll go to Amazon, it's the same thing. Um, we'll change, we'll click on the uh, lock icon over here again, and it's saying that the connection is secure. We'll click on it, and now we'll click on certificate is valid, and it is so, uh, showing, as you can see, that the certificate is issued to Amazon and by DigiCert, which is the same website which we saw earlier and it is even showing the validity of the certificate. Same thing goes for eBay. If we'll click on this one, we can click on connection is secure, certificate is valid, and you can see there that's a different company which has issued a certificate. So there are lots of different companies through which you can get the certificates for your websites and your businesses online. Now, digital certificates are usually responsible for requesting certificates and maintaining the secrecy of the private keys. Loss or compromise of private key means that the communication are no longer secure. Key holders need to be aware of following the reporting procedures. Um, in a, a case, if your private key is lost or compromised, or loss of the private key could result in a compromise of all the messages intended for that recipient, even if the key is posted immediately to the um, key revocation list. Now next we are uh, seeing the PKI attacks, public key infrastructure attacks. We have uh, sabotage, then we have communication disruption and design and implementation flaws. 
So in Subortage, it's a PKI component. Um, it's a P, uh, PKI components or hardware uh, may be subjected to vandalism, theft, hardware, modification, and insertion of malicious code. Uh, most attacks are designed to cause denial of service. Now communication disruption modification could be it can attack the target communication between the uh, subscribers and the PKI components, which is a public key infrastructure components. Um, then we have the distribution could cause the um, DOS attack, which is denial of service, but may also be used to uh, for the attacker to mount additional attacks such as impersonation or subscribing or other um, ins inserting the fake information, which could lead to uh, social engineering attacks and gathering the information related to the users. It can be designed to implement the flaws like uh, the attacks target uh, flaws, the software or hardware on which the subscri subscriber uh, depends to generate or store the key material and certificates. The attacks can result in malfunction of the software or hardware that may cause a denial of service as well. Now, uh, further, it can have the operator error. The attacker targets uh, improper use of PKI software hardware, and the operators may result in DOS or disclosure or modification of the subscriber keys to the certificates. Uh, operator impersonation, which the attacker can target to use the impersonating a legitimate PKI operator. An operator, the attacker could be almost anything legitimate operator can do, including to generate the keys, issue certificates, revoke certificates, modify the certificates, though um, they'll take complete control of the other website and they'll not be aware of, they'll be issuing the certificates and controlling whatever they want to do themselves. Um, cohesion or the social engineering, these attacks occur when the administrator or the operator of a CA is induced into giving up some control to certificate authority or creating the keys and certificates and then issuing it to the users themselves themselves without the permission of the person who is actually issuing the certificates. Now we have common cryptographic systems and in that we have first of all uh, secure shell which is SSH then SSL, TLS, IPsec and PAP as we discussed um, a couple of slides ago. First of all, SSH, which is Secure Shell, it provides secure remote access. So the application that provides secure remote access capabilities, SSH is viewed as a replacement for the insecure protocol that we had in FTP, Telnet, etc. SSH defaults to port 22 that we use. SSH v1, uh, which is the latest one, has found to contain some vulnerabilities. So it advisable to use SSH version 2 which is quite recent as compared to V1 which is considered to be most secure at the moment. Then we have SSL, it transmits the information securely over the internet. Now it, is intro, it was introduced by Netscape which was a browser long time ago. SSL is both application um, independent and cryptographic algorithm independent. The protocol is merely a framework uh, to communicate uh, certificates and crypt keys and data. On the uh, most widespread use of SSL, um, where we use TLS, which is a successor of it, um, in transport of HTTP traffic securely on the internet, and it is usually referred as HTTPS. Then we have TLS. Uh, it's a successor of uh, SSL encrypts communication between the host and the client. TLS is uh, composed of two layers, uh, which is TLS record uh, uh, protocol and the TLS handshake protocol. Then we have IPsec, which is IP security, an end-to-end -end security technology that allows two devices to communicate securely. Now, in this one, IPsec was developed to address the shortcoming of IPv4. And then, although it's an add-on to IPv4, it is built into IPv6. So IPv6 can be used to encrypt just the data or the data and the header of the data itself. Then we have PAP, which is Password Authentication Protocol. It is uh, used for authentication, but is not secure because of the username and pass, uh, password is usually communicated in a clear text format on the network. 
Now, chap, you might have seen it, these settings in your wireless communication settings on your mobile phones, which is a challenge handshake authentication protocol. Um, it is a more secure than PAP uses handshake uh, hashed value that is valid for only a single logon transaction. So once the transaction takes place, it would be destroyed. Point to point tunneling communication consists of two components. One is transport the maintain the virtual uh, connections and the encryption uh, that ensures the confidentiality. Then we have layer two tunneling which protocol, which is L2TP used to transfer the data over VPN, um, implement the encryption with IPsec, which is internet protocol security. Then we have secure socket tunneling protocol, which is SSTP uses SSL to set up a secure connection with a VPN communication channel. Now we'll see cryptanalysis and uh, what's the basic uh, concept behind it. The, it's a study of cipher tag ciphers and crypto systems with the goal of understanding how they work. And that's what most of the hackers do. They try to decipher it in order to uh, break the security level of these different encryption algorithms. It can be used to bridge the cryptographic uh, security systems to gain access to the content of the encrypted messages. Even the cryptographic key is unknown. So they try to find the weaknesses of it so that they can access the message which is encrypted and being transferred over the network. Now the cipher text only attack an attacker has some sample of the cipher text but lacks the corresponding plain text or the key. So it does not have the key but it have some sample of the cipher text that they have collected by Wireshark or through any other means. The goal is to find the corresponding plain text to determine how the mechanism works. So if they know a part of the text which was actually encrypted and they have the cipher text, they can um, have a correlation between the actual text and the encrypted data it tends to be at least to be the least successful attack because of the attacker has limited knowledge at the outset. Now known plain text attack is where the attacker possesses a plain text and a cipher text of one or more messages and uses this information to determine um, the key um, that uh, was used or they could use in order to uh, hide the information. Now choose and plain text attack is the attacker can generate the corresponding text by deliberate choose and text. Essentially the attacker uh, can feed information into the encryption system and observe the output. So they'll keep on checking by adding certain values that how it affects the output of it. The att attacker may not know the algorithm or the secret key in use but still they can try to check that what's the algorithm used and how can uh, it be decrypted. Now chosen ciphertext attack, the attacker can decrypt a deliberately chosen ciphertext into a corresponding plain text. Essentially, the attacker can feed the information into the uh, decryption system and observe the outputs. Now it's opposite to the plain text attack. The attacker may not know the algorithm or the secret key which is used. A more advanced version of this attack is the adaptive chosen uh, ciphertext attack, which we call it as ACCA, in which the selection of the ciphertext is changed based on the results. Now we are seeing in a table the cryptographic cracking times for DES using different key lengths. So if, it's, if it's a regular user, the budget is only $400 and a 40-bit key can be uh, broken in or can be broken in one week. And whereas 56-bit key would take around about 40 years. So you can see the difference in between and so on for small businesses, corporations and the government agencies, etc that how much time it takes to break the uh, key length or the algorithms of it. Now the recent forms of cryptography are identity based encryption, attribute based encryption, location or position based encryption and quantum cryptography. Now these are some of the recent uh, and future forms of cryptography but there are lots of methods that was employed to attack and obtain the passwords like dictionary password attacks, hybrid attacks, brute force attacks or rainbow tables etc. Now identity based encryption, uh, um, it derives the encryption keys from the user's identity. Then attribute based encryption is, uh, it derives encryption keys based on the descriptive attributes of an entity. Uh, 
then the location or position based encryption um, it drives encryption keys based on the position or the location of the entity and the quantum cryptography uses the quantum mechanism to generate random encryption keys and to exchange them securely on the network and that brings us to the end of the chapter on cryptographic concepts so the summary is cryptographic algorithms and ciphers that we have covered then we cover symmetric and asymmetric encryption the purpose of public key infrastructure hashing cryptanalysis and the future forms of cryptography that's it for today thank you very much